so today we're going to talk about Baton Rouge. And as the red stick, you all know that. But Baton Rouge no longer has gorgeous Spanish soldiers dressed to the nines walking around the streets of Baton Rouge, such as Governor uh, de Galvez. Uh, but we do have wild tigers. And long before these wild tigers arrived in Baton Rouge, indigenous people had mounds throughout the state that were ceremonial. They were gathering places. Uh, the archaeologists and the geologists think that the ones on the LSU campus could be as old as 7,000 years. But they did not have burials in the mounds that they have found. A lot of work is still going on at Poverty Point, so I don't know if anybody has found any burials there or not. I haven't checked lately. Of course, we know that the indigenous people disappeared after the whites began to settle in and bring in diseases, uh, not intentionally most times, but sometimes it just happened. Um, Iberville found in 1699 up on the bluffs where Southern University is today, a red stick. There's different stories, different ways. Some of the first explorers write one story. Uh, other people write different stories. But for some reason, it was like a red pole because it was a ceremonial boundary marker. And the red blood or and or the red tree that was used for this marked the land between the Bayogula tribe and uh, the Homa tribe. No French settlement existed until 1718, and the records show that there was a property given to a family that established, um, trying to make a plantation at that point. They had 25 slaves and two white men and it was 95 leagues from the mouth of the Mississippi River. Historian Mark Carlton tells us that um, French Baton Rouge doesn't really exist because that was the first French settlement and then the English showed up. And Mark Carlton, who is one of our best known uh, historians says that that in 1763, when the British established this little fort uh, was when Baton Rouge actually became established. It was built in 1779 by the British, but it was soon acquired by the Spanish. I'm not going to talk about the history of all of those wars and disagreements because you've all heard about that. If you've been in Louisiana for any time, you know about how the greedy Spanish and the greedy British were fighting over the Mississippi River. Because, of course, the Mississippi River, as it is still today, was a lifeline for everyone. The reason that the indigenous people settled in what is now Baton Rouge was because they lived off the bounty of the Mississippi River. This is a drawing of, uh, drawn by Surveyor Latour of the area, and the, this map that you're seeing here is a contemporary of his, and his name was Bartholomew Laughlin. And he drew this map of the Spanish, I mean British and later Spanish fort. By 1810, the residents of Baton Rouge wanted to be American citizens. And the Spanish weren't too happy about that, but there was another little affair that took place at the fort, and uh, one person was killed, one Spanish man, and one cow. But then Baton Rouge started to have settlers, and this is Beauregard Town. This is a beautiful piece of artwork, not just a map of Beauregard Town. And uh, Latour is the one who drew this. He did not draw the fort. Uh, some of the lots were occupied almost immediately in 1806 after it was founded. But then when the Civil War came, 
the area was very, very poor and nobody was buying property. So after the uh, economy improved after the Civil War was when Beauregard Town really became fashionable. That was the place to live. And today, there's a little bit of local history on every street corner. And if that's not enough for you, go down to Spanish Town, which was 1805 established. And there's another, just it's just a walking history tour. It's a wonderful place to visit. Did any of your parents live, or families live in Spanish Town or Beauregard Town? Think, yes, think of all the places you have seen there and all of the things you wonder about. When I walk past one of those houses, I wonder about its history. Uh, and that could occupy me for the rest of my life, I'm sure. This is a beautiful marriage certificate, handwritten by Judge Tessier for John Bueller, whose property was a big, huge part of land where Magnolia Cemetery, the National Cemetery, and I think, and where the penitentiary was at one time. Bueller was the settler of that, and it was known as Bueller Plains. So he had a lot of land there. And this is his marriage certificate. And uh, she was a widow, and they married in 1837. This 1840 drawing of Baton Rouge's riverfront was published in Frank Leslie's magazine. Are you a native with Baton Rouge, with lots of history here, family going back, or are you like me in a transplant, if 1986 can be ruled recent, uh, who's made their home here, as Catherine said, I finally stopped rolling around the world, and I've been here and have no intention to leave. So I've established a little bit of history here myself, working at the LSU libraries and with wonderful people at the archives and the uh, local libraries. If you do have history of Baton Rouge, start making a little notebook if you haven't already. Write down what you know about your family, because this is about your history and your family's history. It's just like doing genealogy. The first rule is talk to the oldest living relatives you have. And I recommend that you always use a tape recorder because the joy of hearing their voices in later years is wonderful. And everybody's, I bet, telephone has a recorder in it. And there's, a, there's an app for that. Is there, I just got a new car, and it's like when I first got an iPhone, I don't know how to operate it. Because it talks, and it's got all these buttons. Um, one thing about this 1840 drawing is it, it looks like a pretty nice town, doesn't it? Nice little town. Well, people who wrote about living or trying to settle in Baton Rouge at this time, their letters and their diaries talk about... Um, the muddy, impossible to drive your wagon through, animals in the streets and in the yards, miserable little town. But this looks nice. <laughs> Those streets evidently did not look that good. Uh, one of our most famous Baton Rougeans was President Taylor. He was here when the fort uh, became after 1810, 1812, when the Americans took over the fort, he was the commandant of that area. And this is in 1849, roughly, when a lot of his people that had served under him in the Mexican-Texas War um, signed a, a wonderful drawing of him. But unfortunately, as you can see, it was kept in the family home and it got wet in a, in a descendant of Taylor. And the top part, which is the lovely lithograph drawing of Zachary Taylor, uh, was damaged beyond, I mean, you, I couldn't even show it in the picture. But he was here for a while too, before he went off to be president. There's another wonderful drawing of him standing at the little home which he lived in down on the riverbank and his horse. This is an 1850 view of Main Street, just a block from the Mississippi River. If you look hard enough, you can see the smokestack of the paddle wheel. 
There was a fire in 1849, and it burned a good portion of the town. And after that fire, the city council said, okay, no more wood buildings. Everybody's got to build with brick. And they also began a fire station. So that was a devastating fire, but it led to some good things. <clears throat> Sometimes you see people who have kept their family records. This is an 1850 journal that was used to uh, record lists of slaves at a Louisiana plantation. However, I could never determine what plantation it was because at the LSU libraries and archives, we have lots of those. And the reason I put it here before the old state capitol is because materials like that were stored in the old state capitol after the government moved into the old state capitol. So it became, Baton Rouge became the capital of Louisiana in 1846. And one of the funniest stories and some of the funniest things to read are things that the legislators who had to come and live in Baton Rouge wrote about living here. There weren't enough saloons. <laughs> They'd been living in New Orleans, so how can you compete with that? Um, but the fire stopped the building on this, which had been designed by James H. Dakin in 1847. So the fire kept them from going forward with their building, and they finally got back to work and um, in 1852, the legislature actually moved in, and, a lot of, and then they started collecting records and things about the local citizens, like the journal I had showed you. Magnolia Cemetery was the first official city cemetery, and it opened in 1852. William Waller was the surveyor for Magnolia Cemetery, and he proposed this layout of the cemetery, and that layout is still the way that the cemetery is laid out and the plots are laid out. But the thing I love about Waller's drawing was he named some of the areas, some of the little squares, and he was very lyrical in his naming. He said some of these streets will be the Street of Mortality, the Street of the Cross, the Street of the Resurrection, and the path of the blessed, among others. For the burial sections, some of his suggestions were saint's rest, forest shade, vesper dale, fount of tears, and morning sides. It's so sad that none of his suggestions were used, but the layout of the cemetery is this layout. During the Civil War, uh, former slaves and slaves that were still with their masters fled to Baton Rouge hoping for food and shelter. This picture was taken in 1863. You've all heard of Sarah Morgan, whose home was burned during the occupation of the Union troops. We do not think this is particularly Sarah Morgan and Judge Morgan's house, but this was in the area where the houses were hit by shells from the riverboats. I guess they were called warships of some sort. Um, but. Sarah Morgan's diary was published, and if you haven't read it, you'll learn a lot of Baton Rouge history by taking a look at a Civil War diary by a teenage girl, uh, Sarah Morgan. Something that gets forgotten, though, is there were a lot of young men from the northern states who, once they took Baton Rouge in the Union, these men were sent here to work and be soldiers in Baton Rouge. And his one diary that is so poignant when he writes to his wife and mother in 1863, his name was Lieutenant William H. Whitney, and he was from upstate New York. And he didn't volunteer. He was conscripted by the Union Army and sent to Baton Rouge. I don't know exactly what happened to him. I know Tara Laver did uh, a transcription of this diary, and she has an article in Louisiana history that might give you the rest of the story. Before there was uh, a great big Mardi Gras celebration in Baton Rouge, and no St. Patrick's Day parade, there was the Fireman's Parade. 
And these were elaborate. They had contests about who made the best float. This one is in 1888. The grand prize for the winning float was $2. Boy, what a prize. Steel Burton, who is one of our best known architectural landscapers, uh, is one of the children on this float. He was three years old. And I just think it's adorable. And their firemen's parades were a Baton Rouge favorite, much more important than Mardi Gras at that point. And they rolled through town from 1870 until 1914, when the First World War started. Uh, it's a delightful picture. Family papers. I'm not even going to ask you to answer me, but I want you to think about how your family treasures are being taken care of. Or maybe you don't take care of them, but someone in your family does. Uh, are they safe? Are they clean and dry? Are they in a controlled environment? Good, good air conditioning, proper heating, out of sunlight. As you all know, sunlight drains the color out of everything, including your skin. So it's, it's something to be aware of. This tintype, how many of you do not know what a tintype is? Ah, good, I don't have to explain it then. A tintype photograph of a World War I soldier. It's been damaged by rough handling. Perhaps he carried it in his pocket. Perhaps he sent it home to his family here in Baton Rouge. Uh, and it got beat up on the way home. But the family over in West Baton Rouge Parish treasures this tintype, and it's well taken care of now. It has its own case of glass. Uh, this was taken in 1918. Do you recognize this building? It's the Women's Club building at the corner of North and East Boulevards. And it was the Christian church, it was what it was built for. But in 1921, a group of women's clubs in Baton Rouge got together and purchased the building for a woman's club building where they could have their meetings, where they could have socials, they had very fancy dances. Uh, and it's a wonderful building and it's still there. You can't talk about wild tigers without talking about Huey Long. Huey Long loved the LSU band, and here you see him walking with the two drum majors. One drum major wasn't enough for Huey. He had to have two, and both of these young men stood without their hats well over six feet tall, because even though Huey was my height, he wanted to be chaperoned by these beautiful young men who stood so tall and then they wore their big huge hats as well and this is when he was leading the band after it got off off the train in Ole Miss where they were going to play football with Ole Miss I wonder who won that game um, again uh, the cemeteries in Baton Rouge are full of history and if you have a family that is buried in one of the local cemeteries does your family have a tradition of caretaking of that grave? If you're Catholic, you know about All Saints Day and the cleaning of the graves. And, but it's also, uh, surprisingly, a North Georgia Baptist church tradition as well. So I guess it came over with a lot of our families. But if you do have a tradition of that, be sure to, you know, enjoy that because it's a very wonderful thing. This crucifix, uh, in St. Joseph Cemetery is not, it's dedicated to Catherine Wiley, who died in 1935, but her grave is not under the crucifix. It's in her family plot at the Stratinsky plot. This is called a cenotaph, when a person has a memorial, but their grave is not under the memorial. As you can imagine, uh, Wartime was kind of hard on everybody. This is a uh, invitation to the end of the year LSU band. Uh, everybody was brought together and they had a banquet and all they could do to have a program that year was to find a mimeograph machine 
Now, I can see some of you might know what I'm talking about, but it, was, it was, had ink on a barrel and it cranked, and that's how we made copies. Uh, and they printed up, they typed up this little program, and then they printed copies of it. Their other programs from other years were printed by a printer. They had color photographs. This is how poor they were, and I think it's a pretty important artifact. 1972 LSU, Vietnam War protest on the LSU campus. Do, it, do you recognize any of your friends in here? <laughs> yes, those things happened in Baton Rouge too. Free Speech Alley still exists, and people will still drive you crazy by standing there and screaming at you. And sometimes they have interesting people. So this is a tradition that goes on at LSU. And then Southern University is so close to us. It's a wonderful place. And I could have included a lot of photographs of Southern, but one of my favorite people is in this photograph. Fourth from the right is Dr. Pinky Gordon Lane. She was the first African-American to be named the Poet Laureate of Louisiana. Pinky was a wonderful poet. She wrote lots of wonderful family history. She was a delightful, intelligent person, but she was not a very good uh, tender of her papers. When I brought that collection to the LSU library, box after box after box, I know some of y'all have been through this, but for someone who was such a literary giant, she didn't know how to file. <laughs> And she was an English professor, too. Uh, but that was not her priority, because you could tell in the box of all of her poetry drafts, that was her priority. And so I, she was just one of my favorite people. <clears throat> in 2008, this memorial in Magnolia Cemetery was erected to the victims of a yellow fever epidemic in Baton Rouge in 1878. The total number of people who died is clearly unknown because people died so frequently and the, grave, the burials were so hasty. We do know that in the road between Magnolia and the National Cemetery, some people were prob their bodies are probably under that paving because it was just hasty trenches built. We think about, Chip Landry thinks about 114 victims are buried under the pavement of the street. And so again, no one knows the exact number, but uh, the cemetery board and uh, Historic New Orleans, I mean, his Historic Louisiana, decided that they deserved a monument. It's a beautiful monument, and if you're visiting Magnolia Cemetery, be sure to take a look at it. The Baton Rouge Weekly Advocate printed a partial listing of the known dead on November 22nd, 1878. And you might see some names that you recognize from some of your people. I wanna talk about taking care of your papers and writing your family history or your personal history. Uh, again, as I said, keep things that are you know, super, super precious out of sunlight. One of the things that people always fuss at me about is that I tell them, when you're looking at your family treasures, don't stand there with the window open with the curtains and the sun streaming in on it. Close those curtains. I even like to have people have their home uh, archives in a dark room. <laughs> you know, close the curtains, don't let the sunlight in. Um, go and talk to those people that are the oldest living relatives in your family. Talk to the people at your church, your community center. Talk to them, record them, and then begin to share. This family history has its most value in sharing. Get that out there to your friends and relatives. For those working with 19th and 20th, early 20th century materials, there it's, you're gonna run across some things that are fragile. There are a lot of things you can do. You can get special boxes. You can get special papers. You can store these things. Um, here are some sources. And I left a, a little checklist of these kind of uh, things and information out at the registration desk. 
but you can uh, follow the guidelines at the National Archives on their website about how to preserve family archives, papers and photographs. It's got lots of great information. Um, temperature and humidity. Damage more paper than mice or bugs. Of course, you know, there are those people who think that cockroaches will eat the earth, and they may. But at the meantime, you want to keep your papers away from them. But don't use poisons. And I, I, that's a separate lecture that I will not go into at this time. Um, scrapbooks. How many archivists are in the room here today? Sticky photograph albums, right? In the 1970s, some idiot, not genius, idiot, <laughs> invented a scrapbook for photographs and memorabilia, like postcards and ribbons and things like that. It's black paper, and it's got a plastic top, and it's sticky. You have just ruined a treasure. I have cried over these things. I have thrown them at the wall. I have abused my student assistants <laughs> by making them do something about these things. We came to the solution, and I do this and I advise people that I work with today, let's photograph the scrapbook. We have magnificent phone photography capabilities these days. Even your telephone will photograph it very well. That's going to preserve the way that your ancestor or your mother or, you know, whoever. Put that scrapbook of photographs and sticky pages together. You're not going to be able in your lifetime to remove the sticky from those photographs. It's a sad state of affairs, but for all intents and purposes, they are destroyed by that invention. A lot of, our, a lot of archivists have cried over those things. But the photographs, you can make a new album. You can print a book of what the photographs looked like in their original form in that album. You can also do that with other scrapbooks of the kinds that uh, they always put lots and lots and lots of newspaper clippings in. And everybody knows how quickly. You don't have to be an archivist to have this problem of how quickly your newspaper clippings disintegrate. So if you have a scrapbook with this kind of thing, I again recommend that you photograph the pages and then you have a facsimile of what that original scrapbook looked like. And lots of older scrapbooks have great-great-grandmother's recipes written on little cards. Those are fantastic to find. I can't cook, but I love to read recipes. And you may need to get some boxes and folders and upgrade how your materials are stored. Enjoy, but preserve. Make an inventory of your materials and keep that. And again, I say share. If you are looking for a home for your family papers and records, talk to your favorite librarian. He or she will direct you to the East Baton Rouge Parish Baton Rouge Room, the LSU Archives, the Southern Archives. Uh, any number of places can help you with that. And don't forget where you're sitting. You're in the State Archives. And I know some people here who can help you out. <laughs> so thank you for having me visit with you today. It's always a pleasure to talk to such wonderful people who we, we're all obsessed with this interest, and uh, I know y'all do good work. And take care of your family papers and share them. Write your story. Write your story of your history of Baton Rouge. There's a writer in all of us. Thank you so much.